This week on the agenda, redefining the global economy for a new era. We speak to economist Mark Uzan about how best to reinvent Bretton Woods. In 1944, delegates from 44 countries gathered in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, in the United States to agree on a system of economic order and global cooperation. Eighty years later, the seeds sown there for the likes of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank still dominate the world. But with the rise of countries like China and the rest of the global south, many think it's time for a substantial rethink of those Bretton Woods institutions. One of those is French economist Professor Marc Ouzin, executive director and founder of the Reinventing Bretton Woods Committee. And he joins me now. Thanks ever so much, uh, Marc, for coming on the agenda. You know, um, the world is going through enormous change with, with geopolitical tensions, with, with economic strains. Are we at a point now when post-war global institutions and financial institutions need an overhaul? And, and if so, where do we start? This year, this is the 80 years anniversary of the Bretton Woods Conference. And we have anniversary, either you reflect on the past or you reflect on the future. And I think today, indeed, as you mentioned, we are at a turning point. We don't know if multilateralism will survive. Are we going to be in a world without multilateralism? How the Bretton Woods will be able to survive this major shift happening not only in the global economy, but also in the political sphere. You have been talking about protectionism, trade tensions, maybe soon currency wars. This is very reminiscent of the interwar years. And you might remember interwar years, currency instability, tariff, protectionism, mm. as trigger, unfortunately, many unintended consequences. So as you mentioned, I, I am a believer that this is a turning point, And this is a moment not only to reinvent Red Bulls or to reform, but to transform the global financial architecture. It's going to be a major challenge. Yes. This has been on, on the agenda for almost 30 years since uh, you know, the Asian financial crisis, the Mexican financial crisis, all the emerging market financial crisis we have been witness, but also the yeah. global financial crisis. So yes, this is a big moment. We can think a lot about what needs to be done. And yeah. maybe as a world as it is, maybe we need to think differently. And yeah. I will be happy to provide some suggestions you know, yeah. to the global financial community. Mark, every country looks to China when it comes to possible changes. And at the G20 um, summit, um, President Xi Jinping restated what he called the question of our times. That is, what's wrong with the world and what we can do about it. What do you think can be done? Well, you might remember that the 1990s was about integrating China in the global economy. And we can argue today that it has been quite successful. China is the second largest economy in the world, has been becoming so important. China has been a responsible stakeholder. Now, the question is, what can we do? Because we see vocabulary words, as I mentioned before, trade tension, protectionism, currency war, that should not be about confrontation. We should shift the agenda and the conversation to cooperation. Of course, it's very hard today because it looks that the world is fragmented. We need to find a way that at the end, what is the most important thing for the global economy is to rebuild international cooperation. Mm. It's about to accept that there is new emerging powers. This is about maybe thinking differently about the global economy. Mm. That you have a group of countries who are willing to do things together, but we also have global public goods. We all know that we need to fight something which is about climate change. So we need to revamp, we need to transform, but we need to do it together. And of course, you can have and you can think about cooperation, you can think about competition among countries, you know, but we need to make sure that we keep a paradigm of orchestrating international cooperation. But maybe we yeah. need to do it differently as we have done over the last 80 years. 
So maybe we need to think differently at home uh, as well as on the international stage. I mean, you've talked about this very um, complicated economic backdrop. Well, what's it going to take to restore the consumer confidence to get people spending to help economies like China's grow? Well, you know, like, when you think about the global economy, first you need to put your domestic house in order, OK? So China, the second largest global economy, is facing major challenges. Inflation, you know, a lot of debt accumulation, the need to reduce this overhang of debt. And we want to make sure that China will not follow, you know, the challenging and the difficulty that Japan went with this deflation trap. It will take time mm. because high level of indebtedness, you know, and the fact that uh, this muddling through has a huge impact on China growth model. So there is one thing that China needs to be doing at home, putting the house in order to make sure that they don't follow the mistake that Japan did during the uh, 1990s, 2000, in terms of making sure that they need to find a way to make sure that there is still reviving growth, reducing debt, and to make sure they don't go to this deflationary trap. Of course, it's more easier to say than to, to implement. And of course, in the case of China, when you think about China growth model, it's less and less about quantitative growth. It's about the quality of growth. And of course, one of the other challenge for China is the fact, you know, that compared with other advanced countries, the young population is not consuming, is saving. And the older population is consuming. So we need to reverse that trend. Yeah. We need to make sure that China, young generation, young people go to consumption versus to savings. So issue of setting up a social safety net will be very critical for China. So Let's look at those longer-term challenges that, that, that China faces. The, the aging population, the shrinking workforce, um, rows with the United States and now the EU over security, trade, over technology. What's your outlook there? Well, you have, I will say, you can add also another challenge that is going to come soon, which is going to be the U.S. tariff. This U.S. tariff will be also a new risk for China economic growth. You have deflationary pressure, and you can see also in the state of the global economy what is going to be a priority for many countries is about economic security, is about reducing dependencies. For many years, Europe and China, for example, have a long-standing relationship, but Europe starting to become concerned about being very dependent on China. So everything has been changing in terms of paradigm also, which is all about reducing dependency, increasing economic security. And you have the external, you know, challenge for China. It's about rebuilding links mm. with many countries, particularly in the US and with the EU. For the EU is the largest trading partner for China, you know, in terms of a relationship. So what can be done here? for China and for the rest of the world to agree maybe on a new set of relationship in terms of economic relations. Because that has a huge impact, not only for these major trading partners, but for the rest of the world, including emerging markets. So you've talked about the relationship with the EU, but the other important one, of course, being with the, with the United States. And at the APEC um, summit meeting between President Xi and President Biden, um, there was a lot of talk about a smooth transition to Donald Trump's second term. And how do you see that playing out? Well, I think we need to prepare for two scenarios. The first scenario, it is very clear with the future Trump administration, the main narrative coming out of uh, his campaign are also been about U.S. tariff acts. Okay? This U.S. tariff acts particularly focusing on China, will have a huge impact in terms of the U.S.-China trade relation. There is going to be a China policy response to this tariff. What I'm concerned is not only about this tariff, because we learn about history that protectionism tariff has a huge impact with economic instability and the prospect for growth for the global economy, but that might trigger 
currency war. And this is exactly what was reminiscent in the interwar years that have created many problems in the global economy. And this is why that some visionaries starting to think about Bretton Woods, starting to think that we need a new world economic order to prevent currency instability and to prevent trade war. That was a lesson of the interwar year that brought Bretton Woods. So when you think about the international system and global governance, we might need to think differently about, yes, maybe we need to transform these institutions because they serve the global economy quite well. I don't think it's going to be a win-win situation if the global economy is heading toward barriers, tariffs, and we will be losing what also was quite important for the global economy, that was a benefit of globalization. We need to redefine what globalization will be today because we know that we need to anchor the middle class. We need to set up a new social safety net. So this is why I am at the same time optimistic that despite all the challenges we are talking about, about China, economic challenges, mm -hmm. the rise of tariff that the US wants to implement, I don't think this is a solution for the global economy. So we need to have experts around the world to say, okay, that this is not the way to go, because yeah. it will not be a win-win situation for the global economy. Let's pause there, but do stay with us as still to come here on the agenda, the role of the global south in reimagining the global financial system. borders, across continents, connected by ideas, a shared humanity. Stay connected. Welcome back to The Agenda. And let's return now to my conversation with Professor Mark Uzan, Executive Director and Founder of the Reinventing Bretton Woods Committee. What can the rest of the world learn from the way China is dealing with its domestic economic challenge? Well, you see, I remember in 2008, when we were in the verge of this global financial crisis, China was a responsible stakeholder at that time to play an important role to a major fiscal stimulus that helps the global economy quite well. Okay? Yeah. So now China is facing, as we mentioned before, you know, deflationary pressure at home, mm -hmm. a lack of consumption, and policymakers are starting to act. Is it enough? Maybe not. So the question is, before, you know, we were thinking when we look at the global economy, there was only one hegemonic power that has a huge impact in terms of uh, spillover to the global economy. But, you know, you have two main powers, I would say, yeah. the U.S. and China. So China needs to find a way first, because every country, you know, thinks first about his own country, his own economic, macroeconomic policy before thinking about how it will impact the rest of the world. Yeah. If China cannot rely on an export-led growth model as it used to be, okay, yeah. like it was in the 1990s and the, in the 20s, so where China was becoming a major trading partner with most of the, the world, so China needs to think more and more domestically. What can be done to increase consumption? What can be done to reduce the level of indebtedness of municipalities? And I think the measure that has been announced recently are, are a good starting point. But many foreign analysts and many maybe local experts think that might not be enough for the size of China's uh, economy. 
So I think we have already some signals that was not the case a year ago, that China start to realize that they don't want to go back to a deflationary pressure that will linger this economic yeah. imbalance. So consumption, yes. Quality of growth, yes. Relying less on export, yes. And moving more and more toward a very high-tech economy. So you're talking then about what China is doing and those seeds of growth at home. What can China do to help reshape the global financial system? You, you, you talked about helping amplify those voices of the global south. Um, you, you talked about um, entering into deeper trade arrangements with, with Europe and possibly um, the United States. But what, what's it going to take? Is it de-dollarization? Well, I don't think so. Let me, there are two parts. You know, when you think about transforming global governance, I believe that China, for the last 10 years, has been providing some policy responses. First, China set up a new set of institutions, AIIB, yeah. uh, BRIC forums, the new development bank, also many swap lines with many central banks. But China never disengage with the British institution. China is still very committed to the IMF and to the World mm. Bank the fact that China can also act, realize that there have been some few development in terms of quota, in terms of shares, because China being the second largest economy, China quota the IMF shouldn't be much larger. But despite the fact it's becoming impossible to accept this new reality, China has not disengaged. So what China is doing and can contribute to the global governance debate? There have been a lot of talk about the BRIC meeting that happened, you know, two weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, when there was the IMF World Bank meeting. So there was this optic, the sense that you have the IMF World Bank meeting in Washington and you have the head of state BRICS meeting happening at the same time. A feeling that you have like two competing governors, yeah. two competing global blocks, you know, one driven by China and one driven by the US. I think this is the wrong narrative. You can accept in the world that is becoming more diversified, that you have more emerging markets who are not anymore emerging but are becoming more influential, mm. that the world is more diverse, that you can accept to have different type of uh, regional blocks that are emerging. Look at the EU. It's a, already a regional block. You have a group of countries who are willing to work together. So I think the geography of the global economy is changing. Yeah. China has more relationship with Central Asia countries. China has new type of relationship and more, more influence with Latin America, and of course in Asia. What can be done, that's why I believe the transformation of global governance might emerge by having the IMF and World Bank becoming more decentralized type of global institutions. Instead of having a global one, you can start to think about an IMF in Europe, an IMF with a strong anchor in Asia. So you become closer to the countries. You become closer to the new type of, of trade relationship. I believe this is the way I see the global economy and global governance. You can have the BRIC countries. If you think about what is in common with all the BRIC countries, they all want to reform or to challenge the US hegemony with the dollar. Yeah which is very different with the big debate about global governance reform of the IMF and the World Bank. I think there is always, you know, when you, people start, okay, what needs to be done about reforming Bretton Woods? A lot of global South countries say it's about the international monetary systems, the way it operates, and the fact that the US dollar is still a hegemony. Uh, currency was an exorbitant privilege because the US, of course, can yeah. borrow in their currency. So I'm not a believer about a BRIC currency, and I'm pretty sure that China is not also a proponent of having a BRIC currency. And it's interesting because China's president, she has talked about strengthening the voice of the global south through the G20. It is tricky, though, isn't it? Because while there are points in common, there are many, many points of difference. Yes, I think... It, it, all of this, what you, you describe here, you feel a sense of frustration with global governance. 
Okay? Yeah. For the last 40 years, they always have reform on the margin, but it was reform about the global financial system. It was all about we need to reform uh, to create the Financial Stability Forum to detect vulnerabilities in the financial system. You see, it was more technocratic reform. What we need today is like, I would say, an adjustment with the global economy. Every country wants to be part of the global economy and global governance. They don't want to be innocent bystanders. They want to contribute to the system. And it cannot just be driven just by the US, Europe, and China. So how you give a voice to these countries? They are, and I'm, I'm totally a believer of this, they are legitimate players. They want to contribute to the global discussions. What can be done? Maybe it's not the G20. G20 is a group of countries that were created after the Asian financial crisis because we call it them systemic emerging market, you know? So G7 wanted to have a dialogue with the main emerging market. That's what G20 came out, came all about. I think IMF and the World Bank are global universal institutions. You have more than 191 countries who are members. What can be done to transform this institution? I believe this is where to start. The global south and all of these countries, they all talk about reforming. We need to transform versus to reform. We don't need to give a voice only. We need to make sure they contribute to the conversation, to the discussions. Yeah. So I am a believer that this is a turning point, as we described at the beginning. A major change is going to happen. Or oh, if not, the alternative will be a world without multilateralism. Let's face it. You know, can we preserve this international institution because they serve the global economy quite well? But they need also to pivot to something new. They need to accept yeah. that the world is not just driven by these two, three largest uh, economic blocks. So, so what you're saying is that there needs to be much more um, discussed around cooperation, about partnerships and collaboration and far less about confrontation. Absolutely. Let's, for, let's put it, OK, you tell me, Mark, you are not realistic. Look, uh, Trump is coming, confrontation with China, tariff. But I think sometimes there are more rhetoric because US and, and China need each other, OK? The trade is very deep between these two countries. You are not going to destroy what has been for the last 30 years, you know, the build up of the, opening up of China, of trade relations with the rest of the world. But I, I am think that this is a moment that, despite this confrontation, can bring, as the Chinese say, you know, opportunity. There is maybe opportunities today to change global governance, but to bring a new set of middle powers who are willing maybe to come up with some proposal to the global financial architecture that will serve not only the major countries, but the whole world. Why, for whenever you have a crisis, politicians always ask, we need to reform the Bretton Woods institutions. We need to reform the global financial architecture. So there is something that go beyond international institutions. This is also many policymakers, you know, have, I think, some links, personal links to these international institutions when they go back to work to their own country and when they became minister or governors. So this is not just about institution to reform. This, they build up a global network. I think it serves the world. I think we just need to be more ambitious to accept that we need to change, not on the margins, but to accept that the change we face in the global economy from climate to shift to have enough resources and finance to deal with climate change for countries in terms of mitigation, adaptation. We need to accept that the global financial safety net, we need to be reformed. We need to accept that the global self is here. I think this is a challenge for the new generation. We have not been able to do this. So I'm, at the same time, optimistic because, you know, from Chinese official, from U.S. official, from European, from global south, you still have an end call that everyone wants this institution to be reformed, but we need to find maybe some new drivers or reformers and maybe new generation. Not only, I will say, retro, but also the World Trade Organization. 
with part of this, um, I will say, global institution that has served the global economy quite well in the 60s, 70s, 80s, despite many financial crises that we have to deal with. It's interesting you talk about being more ambitious. Some might say that some of the global goals on climate change, for example, are too ambitious, and that's why it's taking so long to make any headway. I mean, if you're talking about shaking up these institutions, which are so very entrenched and have been for decades, who is going to lead that charge? Is this a, an arena where China could have more clout? I totally agree. Look, China has more clout, but do China wants today to play a more important role in shaking up? The fact that you have I will say a sense of two types of governance in the world. You know, I think it's like um, having an insurance. I think the Chinese have been working on setting up these new institutions to make sure that in case nothing is happening at the global level, they have, you know, tools with AIB, with a break, with a swap line, and other and uh, new links with so many countries in case they see nothing happening at the global level. So we need to, that's why I believe, so this is not the best choice for China. I think the best choice for China is to have a more influential role in the British World institutions where they can also help support the changes needed. You know, think about the World Bank. You know, World Bank and China always have important relationship for many years and many decades. So I, 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 am, I believe that China, we're not giving up the Brent Rules Institution. China will want to have a more say, more influence, and also more responsibility. And I think the managing director of the IMF and even the president of the World Bank are quite aware about all of this. You know, you might have learned about this uh, project that they initiated called Bread Moves at 80 to try to bring a group of experts to provide some ideas about what needs to be done to bring this institution to these new challenges that we have been talking about, fragmentation of the global economy, climate, yeah. uh, the rise of the global south. So I think there is a major awareness among the president of the World Bank and the managing director of the IMF, that we cannot do business as usual. But I think it will take not only the, the, the president of the institutions, but the global community at large, you know, to say this is a moment. Yeah. This is a moment. There are a lot of things happening, but it's very hard yet to see how it will be shaping yes. up. Because everyone in October at the IMF was wanting to find out what will happen with U.S. elections? Now we know. But sometimes you have surprise, you know, the, the, the way the narrative about confrontation mm -hmm. can change and shift it to something different. Yes. If you have a global financial crisis tomorrow, is the international community will respond as forcefully as they have done in, two, in, uh, in the 2007, 2008 financial crisis with the highlight of the G20 head of state in London. Yeah. That's a big question. Remember, for the moment, we don't have this, you know? But a cri financial crisis can eat. And what I'm very worried is about a trigger of currency wars. Yes. Again, with maybe yeah. the, the tariff that the Trump administration wants to, to implement. Mark Uzan, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You can watch every episode of The Agenda in full on CGTN Europe's YouTube channel. And for exclusive extra content from me, my guests and the rest of the team, don't forget to check out At The Agenda Show on TikTok. Coming up on a future agenda, we'll look back at the final communique from COP29 to consider whether we're really any closer to saving the planet. But for now, from me, Juliet Mann, and from all the Agenda team here in London, goodbye.